listening to the Astral Hour. I'm your host, Astral Meadow. Join me as we take a glimpse into the mysterious. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm joined with my friend Daniel Matson. He teaches traditional Shaolin Kung Fu, Tai Chi, and self-defense. There's more to it than just the martial arts. You can also learn how to enrich your life by enhancing yourself mentally, physically, socially, emotionally, and spiritually. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming out. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I've been really looking forward to this episode. Um, We had it all planned out to record in December, but then everybody kind of got a little ill and we had to reschedule it. So this is nice. It's been brewing in my mind for a while so it's like finally manifesting so it's about time (laughs) yeah totally so um when did you first start getting into kung fu and um how long have you been teaching it well how i got into kung fu was actually the karate kid movie i i remember watching it as a child and being so enamored by it that when we had when we had it on VHS, you know, back in the day when those existed, mm-hmm. uh, I remember watching it three times in a row, three times in a row. I watched that film, and I have never done that to this day with any other film. <laughs> I I remember being in our living room and trying to m- trying to mimic those movements that I saw on the film and resonating with just martial arts in general. So my parents, recognizing that in me, they just said, well, we've got to find Daniel a martial arts school to go to. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they just kind of shopped around for what was available at that time period. And um, they found Shaolin Kung Fu being taught by a guy named Gary Mullins. And they took me to the school. And I, I was probably about, I can't remember the exact age, but eight or nine years old. And... uh I took the classes and I loved it. I mean, I was like a duck in water. I just loved martial arts. And at that time period, I didn't really know any kind of a difference between any kind of styles or anything like that. But I just knew that whatever I was doing at that time, I loved it. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes it's not just the art itself, but also the teacher that really, you know, draws you into that school. And I loved my teacher. He was just the, the perfect teacher for me. Uh, so I started, uh, I can't remember the exact date, maybe 1991 or something like that. But then we moved away. And uh, when we moved away, uh, I tried different martial arts styles. And there's nothing wrong with the various styles that are out there by any means. It's just that they didn't have a teacher. And I loved my teacher so much. And he just had so much passion and charisma that when I became 17 years old, um, I drove out to a place and uh, saw him there. And I just... Uh, said, are you still back at the same place that you were teaching at years ago? He said, yeah, I'm still there. And I said, well, I'll be there next week. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been uh, continuing practicing since I was 17 years old. Oh, wow. And uh, I'm 42 now. So I've been practicing for about, about 25 years. And then uh, as far as teaching goes, um, as of this year, I have, as of January, I just hit my 20-year mark. So I've been teaching for over 20 years. Wow. Hmm. Um, how has your life experience influenced your overall teaching style? Oh, that's a long story. I would say that my life experience has to do with levels of awareness. And what I mean by that is that I I feel like if you have a grand total sum of anything that people have in this lifetime, what do they really carry with them? And that's experience and wisdom, knowledge, and all those essences that they carried that were not the material, not the physical with that. And so I I had something that my teacher was talking to us in class that really resonated with me and, and stuck with me at that time. And he said, if you got put into prison and you didn't have anything but just you you know just clothes that you're wearing what do you really have that you could work on and he said work on that 
And when he said that to me, and I, I remember probably being like 18 years old or maybe 19, something like that, when he said that, I just thought, well, let me start working on those things. Mm-hmm. And that is awareness. And everything that I do within martial arts is to be able to not just create a healthier form for myself, but to create a healthier everything that I would carry with me after this life. Mm. And so when I teach, I feel like that is the essence of what I teach is to give people something that will carry on beyond what they think that they can carry beyond Mm. this life. Right. Yeah, before I went to Kung Fu class, um, I didn't really know too much about it outside of uh, Kung Fu Panda and, you know, just like some movie uh, stuff. But I I really thought about it more just physically um, and just the postures and like what I would see someone do. But as I was doing it, I realized, oh, there's this really big like mind, body, spirit connection. And so, yeah, I'm doing it physically, but I'm also evolving in these other ways so it was really cool to to get that firsthand experience and and like the way that you taught it I could like sense that Mm -hmm. um that it's not just about the postures but like like what are we really doing this for like that there was this this spirituality to it without you being direct about it but it's like you just feel it right you're like oh there's some like I'm moving energy I'm I'm having to practice self-awareness. I'm being like conscious of my feet and like how I'm planted on this earth, you know? So maybe that's just me because I tend to get like a little, <laughs> like I bring spirituality into everything, but I don't know. I feel like even someone that, you know, anyone that had the experience, they might sense that. I don't know. So I, I feel like when somebody comes into the school for the first time, and whether or not they've had any kind of prior experience with any kind of martial art, if that person desires to spiritualize whatever that they're learning, then that becomes spiritual Kung Fu to them or spiritual Tai Chi to them. And then other people come in and they don't have any kind of concept about what spirituality is, or maybe they don't believe in that. And -hmm. they come in there and I feel like they only get so far until they they have to start understanding the spiritual concepts that are integrated into this. Right. And they make that decision about whether they want to progress with that form of spirituality or not. Mm -hmm. And it's a spirituality that doesn't necessarily take a form per se, but just something that whatever is going on in their life, whatever belief system that they have, they can embellish on that in the martial arts system. Right. Yeah. Which is great for people from any kind of spiritual walk of life. So it doesn't have to be secluded to somebody being religious or non-religious or believe in any kind of a certain dogma or not. So. Right. I, I kind of picked up on that. And that's how it is similar with the yoga. Like you can have different uh, religions and you can come. So you could be like a Christian and practice yoga. It's like, but you and still like get those benefits of it. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's like almost impossible to separate um, yoga from spirituality because like as I'm doing these postures and moving I mean it's to me it's just like that dance of life I just I don't know it to me it's like integrated um, but I do like that you can do these practices without any kind of dogma and, and you can learn a lot just from the philosophies so I know I guess the little bit I know about kung fu is like it's Is it the Tao Te Ching or like the philosophy of Kung Fu comes from? There's actually several philosophies within Shaolin specifically. Like when when I say the word Shaolin, Mm -hmm. what that does is that embodies Chinese martial arts that, you know, obviously came from China. Mm -hmm. That is an umbrella term that has all kinds of different styles within that one style. Mm -hmm. And similarly, because a lot of people are familiar with yoga and when you use the word yoga, well, there's all kinds of different styles of yoga. There's all kinds of different techniques to be able to practice yoga. Mm-hmm. So when I say the word Shaolin, that's very similar to that concept of oh, that. Okay. So if I said something about uh, with yoga and I just say, do you practice, say, yin yoga? And then somebody, that, that could narrow down what right. yoga means to somebody and say, oh, well, I'm, I'm familiar with that, that type of it or that style of that. So when we get into Shaolin, we can start narrowing that down into several different types of philosophies. And you have conflicting philosophies. And you have philosophies that 
in a sense, would combat the other philosophy. And we'll get into that probably a little bit later when we talk about the different styles of martial arts of the animal systems within mm-hmm. Shaolin. Okay. What makes Shaolin Kung Fu different from the other styles of martial arts? Well, I think that each style carries something very special and unique unto itself. And I've, I've never agreed with that statement that a lot of people believe that one style is greater than another. And a lot of times you can see these YouTube videos where they say, this is one style versus this style. But in essence, what you're really talking about is just one person versus another one person. So the concept about what makes it really different and unique is the person's, the individual's interpretation of what that style is. And I believe that what makes Shaolin different than some of the other ones is how many styles are within that style, just like we talked about before being an umbrella term Mm -hmm. with that one. I think that in Shaolin, you have meditation, you have movement of internal energy, you have breath work, you have levels of awareness, And that is something that is integrated into also how you punch and kick. And I think that that can be lacking sometimes in other styles of martial arts where they can make it purely a physical form for Mm, that. I can see that. Um, Could you explain for us the difference between Kung Fu and self-defense? Most people believe that Kung Fu and self-defense... are the same thing. And the way that I use my terminology is that self-defense is the concept or idea of somebody being attacked somehow, and they just simply need to get away from that. But they're not contending or fighting with that other person. They're just doing what's needed or necessary to be able to evade or get out of that particular situation. And that sometimes means in self-defense that you don't make any contact at all with that. Right. So in Kung Fu, I would describe it as that's a person who would be contending with somebody. Now, in Kung Fu, that does not mean that you cannot evade or you cannot leave that situation. That's not what that would mean at all. Mm -hmm. But the idea that you also learn more than just self-defense, you also have that ability to contend with a person or a group of people or situation that you would need to use that martial arts with. Right. I was thinking about this the other day um i think it was the kung the kung fu section of the class because i took two um Mm -hmm. and it was like this redirection like so they're coming at you and you're like oh you're like dodging it and i was thinking about using that concept in everyday life and so like someone's challenging you you know with some argument or they're just coming at you and i was thinking like oh well redirection like maybe change the subject or somehow that would go into the philosophy of tai chi okay okay so the philosophy particularly of tai chi now this would be different for the crane system or monkey or tiger system so again this would be unique to tai chi that this philosophy would be that it is a redirection of force Mm -hmm. not force against force so in that concept of this we we learn physically how to be able to manipulate a person's body that if they come in with a punch, then we can either step out of the way of that or deflect that, not having to meet that force with force. Now, what happens if we take that concept of redirection of force and we apply that to somebody psychologically, emotionally, mentally? Well, an example would be we're having an argument with somebody. Mm -hmm. They come in and they accuse you of something, whatever that it is that's on their mind. And they say, hey, why is it that you didn't do this project or task? Well, understanding Tai Chi, one of those things to be able to redirect it is to get it off of yourself so that you're not absorbing that energy. Mm -hmm. And you can begin talking about the task itself, not about why you did or did not do the task. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be about that. It's about let's talk about the task itself at hand. Now, in attacking somebody within Tai Chi, you would want to use that momentum that they have coming forward towards you and redirect it back on them to be able to subdue them. So again, in that conversation, it could be something to the effect of, well, I see that you're accusing me of not being able to do 
to do the task, but maybe you could demonstrate to them that somehow it was their job responsibility to be able to complete the task, and it was their fault that it wasn't done. Now, right. I'm not trying to put the blame on anybody for that particular situation, right. but just in the concept mm-hmm. about how sometimes you can deflect it, which is what we were talking about just a moment ago with the idea of putting it onto the subject itself and not identifying that with either person. Mm-hmm. Or the idea of if that gets redirected back onto the other person, that maybe it was their fault that it wasn't done and not yours. Right. And they need to know that, that mm-hmm. they're also responsible for maybe that project. So in that philosophy of it, you could use this psychologically with somebody or emotionally with somebody. Right. Could you give us a little bit more background on Tai Chi and can anyone practice it? There are certain portions of Tai Chi that anyone could practice. I think that Tai Chi specifically is something that people could practice at all ages and all levels. A long time ago, I was um, able to work with an assisted living program. And I taught some seniors that had Alzheimer's and dementia. It was actually a group of 12 people. And what we did was we measured what their abilities were by taking a beach ball. And as they were sitting in a chair, most of them were in wheelchairs, we would take the beach ball and we would kind of toss it to them and see if they were able to catch it. And then some of them were able to catch it and throw it back. But that was more rare with the group of 12. So we started working with them as they're sitting in wheelchair doing different Tai Chi exercises, movement of the hands and movement of the wrist and the fingers and the arms together, doing different breathing practices that we would also do with those movements. And if the person had the ability, we would have them stand up. Sometimes we'd have to help the person, like assisted, standing them up with. Uh, they would hang on to us and we lift them up and then put them back down in the chair. So not really walking and stuff, doing the Tai Chi that way. But uh, they would have movement within the legs there. Well, what we would do is after about three months of this, we would measure them again. We would take the ball and we would toss that to them. And we had people who maybe they reacted by just throwing up the hands. Maybe they didn't catch the ball, but that's more than what they did before. Mm -hmm. And then we also had people who could throw the hands up and catch the ball, which they were not doing that before. So I think that even with a group of elderly people, they can still practice Tai Chi. And even if a person is confined to a chair or even laying down in bed, I think that they have the ability to have some of the mobility that people have within Tai Chi. Is the energy that's called Chi the same as prana in the yoga practices? That is a very interesting subject when you talk about energy. And when you talk about energy of any kind of walk with any kind of spiritual form, like when you you know, ask a person from a Chinese point of view about what energy is, or somebody from India, or perhaps an Aborigine person. Mm-hmm. And the idea is that some viewpoints would attribute all energy coming from the same source. So all energy is one energy. Mm-hmm. And that statement is true. However... You can also take that one energy and you can label it and you can dissect it and you can label it and label it and label it upon label. And then the Chinese culture, that's more of what they have done. Mm -hmm. There are three types of main energy. You have what they call the qi energy and then they have jing energy and then you have shen energy. And out of these three energies, just that middle one, the jing energy, they gave over, gave over 200 classifications of that one type of energy. So if I were to ask a person and I say, have you ever laid down in bed at night and your mind is just racing, but your body is really tired? And they said, yeah, I've, I've had that happen before. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, how about this? What about if the body has energy And you're ready to go. You're not ready to sleep, but your mind is just wiped out. It's zapped. And most people say, yeah, I've experienced that before. And I'm like, is that the same energy or is that different? And so for some people, it helps them to be able to classify it differently, to be able to measure it differently, to see it differently, to put different terminology with it. So when people ask me the question about well, what's the differences between the, the names that you guys use for energy, like this chi energy, is it the same as prana? Well, I would, I would try to be able to narrow that to how do they feel with that energy? Mm-hmm. So it might be that some of the energy that they call prana is the same thing that they're calling with chi. 
-hmm. And for other people, it might be something very different and unique. So it depends on individually sometimes what that person believes that energy is to them right. and how they would classify that. Right. So is chi something that you build up within the posture? So as you're doing Tai Chi or Kung Fu, are you like bringing in more chi or are you like balancing the energy that's already there? Is it something that you bring in? Well, in Chinese martial arts, the concept of chi if, if I have a little bit of leeway with this, I would say that you could have chi with a little c and then chi with a capital C. Okay. And what I mean by that is that chi with a little c would be a generic term for just life energy. And then you would have c, chi with a capital C, and that would be refined chi. And what this means is that you can take that original chi that people have and you can change that into the jing energy. Now you'll see, now like I said, there's different classifications of the Jing energy, but one of those is a very quick energy. So you see a young child, and that child is running around so fast. You know, just a little toddler that's just running around. They've got all this energy, but when it's spent, they just collapse and they want to go to sleep. But then you see older people. They don't have that same type of energy where they just run around and then want to sleep. What they do is they have the more sustaining energy. They have energy that they can go to work every day, energy that they can go do a project for several hours. And then when they're done with that, then they can rest after that. So what we're doing with the chi is we're learning how to not only gather that in, but also refine that for, in a sense, inner alchemy. We want to be able to change that energy from one form to another to make it more usable. Now, on a physical level, we do this with so many other things in life. We do this with nutrients. We take that from one form. We change that to another to make it more usable. We take our sugars, and we be able to change that and make it more usable. Why couldn't we do that with energy? So in Chinese martial arts, we try to cultivate that, draw that in, and then be able to change that for the different types of energy that we may need within that martial arts system or martial arts philosophy. Right. I was watching this video earlier and it was, it was talking about chi and, and it was using this mountain analogy and it was saying, as you move up the mountain, you need more energy. And so like that was kind of to this guy, the concept of like building chi was the further that you progress on the spiritual path or up the mountain, um, you need more energy to climb that mountain. So that was kind of the concept of like why you would need to build the chi up. Um, so someone that's just hanging out at the bottom of the mountain might be great with just the energy that's around. But if you decide you want to take the journey, you need to learn to cultivate the chi so that you can maintain, you know, that vitality up the mountain. So it was like on the path. You well, absolutely. I, I think that... In any real spiritual walk, we're going to have to deal with certain types of energy, and we need to prepare ourselves for working with that type of energy. So you need energy to work with the energy. Right. And I think that uh, with martial arts, the ability to be able to do the physical portion of that you know, prepares, prepares the physical body, and then the discipline side and understanding philosophies have to do with the mental, and then practicing it and having that ability to be able to go through certain types of physical pain just in any normal exercise and discipline with that one helps with also the emotional side of that and putting all that together we're changing and cultivating that energy within ourselves to be able to grow and become better right. now you don't have to label that as spiritual anybody can do that mm -hmm. they can just go do these practices and start making themselves become better and growing and growing and they're still going to get benefits out of that as well but the people who are seeking it, I feel like it becomes more exponential to them. It grows much faster. Mm -hmm. I could see that. Um, what are some of the ways that these practices have changed your life? I would say that fundamentally, my whole being has changed because of martial arts. I had all this potential of doing something, but it wasn't directed the way that I wanted it to be directed. And for me as an individual, I needed a certain type of discipline to be able to go into the direction in which I wanted to go to. And I believe that I gained that discipline even though I got 
knowledge or I received knowledge and gained experience from other sources outside of martial arts, but it helped me to fine tune them with the martial arts. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like there's um, a deeper meaning to the discomfort that may arise in certain positions? So people might not enjoy them, but are they, you know, is it helping them grow in some other way? An old Taoist saying is that true stillness is not stillness within stillness, but only stillness within motion. When we practice martial arts, we have to be able to train our body, our mind, and our spirit, which also includes your emotional self, to be able to put ourselves into certain positions, these forms that we practice, and that includes all kinds of different types of exercising. When we do that, I feel like what we're really doing is fine-tuning or pulling all of that together as one. And in that, now some people may not call that suffering. I would definitely call that suffering and pain with the teacher that I had. But with that pain and suffering that I had, I feel like it helped to refine me as an individual to know that I could actually go beyond that physical pain, that I could take that physical pain and set that aside to be able to accomplish the goals that I wanted to be able to accomplish. And at the same time, it gives me awareness of that pain. That is not about the idea of setting it aside to the point of not recognizing that the pain exists because that pain is there for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's not about that either. We're supposed to recognize that pain. And in fact, in certain levels of awareness, it embellishes that pain. You actually see and feel and sense that pain more so. I feel like with martial arts, it helps you to be able to manage that feeling that you have of the pain. It helps you to be able to refine not only the pain itself, but to be able to refine your thoughts about having that pain. What is your attitude towards pain itself? What is your attitude towards that struggle? Especially when we don't have things happen for us immediately in life. And so I feel like having martial arts as an outlet that I can be patient with the experience and I can be patient with myself in is an excellent tool for people to be able to learn how to manage that type of pain. I love that answer. (laughs) The thing is about pain is that at some point we're all going to experience it. So the thing that I kind of pulled from the little class I had is that even if I'm not doing Kung Fu all the time, like it's about learning these ideas so that we can use them in those really challenging moments. So if you challenge yourself before you get there, then it's like you have more awareness in those moments. Like you can make decisions more clearly. It's like you, you can't fully prepare for all of the suffering in the world. But if you just recognize that you will, you know, come up against these ideas at some point, like you're going to feel pain, you're going to feel loss, you know, you're going to experience suffering. But if you understand how you deal with those, right, it's almost like you can brace yourself and be more grounded um, within those really challenging times. So. Well, I love the idea of people being prepared. Mm-hmm. And I, on a personal level, I, I believe in the idea of being prepared for all kinds of different contingencies, such as learning just just a little bit here and there about, say, something like CPR, because right. that might be something that you may need. How to do a simple bandage on a simple wound. You know, any, any of those concepts, ideas about being prepared for something. And I feel like the idea of preparing yourself emotionally and mentally and spiritually and physically recognizing that pain does exist in this world. And we have to be able to deal with that, but we can actually choose how we address it. And I find that that to be something that's very useful within martial arts is how we address that pain. Right. And just feel more rooted within it, Mm -hmm. you know, and there was definitely a lot of leg work when I so the, when I left the class the next day I was like ow <laughs> ouch <laughs> the, you know I do yoga I do a lot of stretching but I I struggle with the root chakra okay so when you do kung fu there's like the what is it the horror or horse stance horse stance so you're like doing these squatting 
you know, really building up the strength in the legs, which makes you feel really grounded, which I also feel like. And they're like, also very torturous, yes. Right, right. <laughs> I, but I was thinking that it's probably a good practice for me as someone that struggles with the root. And I also am kind of airy. So I'm like, I probably need to do practices like that, even though it hurts, <laughs> um, that it might actually be good for me, you know, in a spiritual way, right? So yeah, it hurts physically, but it's probably because I'm struggling so much with that root energy um, and not just growing up in a, an environment that wasn't very stable and didn't have that good grounding vibe. So I have to create that because it wasn't just something I was born into. So it's something to work with, but I'm like, I probably need to be practicing that regularly. Well, I think that within Shaolin, it can be very similar to yoga with the idea that sometimes we do things that are slightly painful with these poses and mm -hmm. postures and exercises, but at the same time, we can do these meditative portions where we're breathing through that experience. And we're also, uh, in, in some portions of it, focusing on something in particular. So like doing the gro uh, grounding and rooting exercises when something called Wuji is just a, a, a practice that we have within the Tai Chi class. So you do those exercises of visualization or inner, moving energy as you're doing it. So when you do other things, even like, say, a push-up or sit-up, something that people may not like and enjoy, they can still have those same philosophies that they've learned within the martial arts portion to do in regular exercises. And I think that that's also pretty interesting and unique for martial arts compared to other styles. Right. I really liked the breath work aspect of it where so yeah I'm uncomfortable but I'm it was like I don't want to say I was dissociating because it's like you can't fully dissociate because you're fit you're doing something physically so you want to be like okay I'm gonna rise above the pain but I would still <laughs> feel it but something about the breathing just like when I gave birth right I'm in excruciating pain but people would be like breathe they would just keep yelling at me to breathe and I'm like I'm breathing but but when I was breathing into them it did help it like it's because I was like distracting the mind but yet I was being very physical so it was like this really cool balance of being present but then using the breath to kind of cope with what I was experiencing so now, I have not made that connection before with Lama's training compared to <laughs> kung fu training but I'm going to use that in the future right. I appreciate that one um <laughs> I, I I take a look at that and I'm like that's perfect because you know, a, a woman giving birth is going to be the most extreme pain. Right. And what you're doing is you're you're teaching yourself to be able to uh, breathe, be mindful of the breath, as well as the entire experience all together at one. That's a great way to describe martial arts. Right. I never, yeah, I wasn't even planning on bringing that in, but that's just the best example for from my timeline of you know, being in this really challenging place and had someone not been there saying, you need to take that breath, right? Because sometimes it was like, I'm holding it because you want when you're in mm -hmm. pain, you want to hold it. And I don't know why that is. But the cool thing about doing the martial arts is it made me so aware of it. Like, you know, I'm inhaling as I move this way, I'm exhaling, you know, and so it's like this dance between breaths. And so there's no restriction. And I don't know, it's like the, it starts flowing more, you know? So when I do like crunches or, or sit-ups, I'm, it's really challenging for me to breathe. Cause I'm like, oh, oh you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I'll do 10 and I'll hold, and I hold my breath the whole time. But with these other, like the energetic ways of like adding exercise and it's different cause it is, it's you're consciously aware of inhale, exhale, don't hold your breath, you know? and being present in the movement. So it's not about like this goal of getting it through it. It's just, if you're not present and aware as you're doing it, what's the point, right? I think that's the whole point right. is being present and present in your body as you're doing these movements. Like you were talking about before, you can't hover above that pain. Right. <laughs> there, there might be times where that's actually needed or necessary to be able to hover above that pain. But the reality is that we have to deal with so much of that on uh, a consistent basis that we have to learn how to be able to, to manage that and deal with it in the present. And I feel like um, having that ability with martial arts with training yourself, you can apply that to anything, like you said, with Lamas training. 
Yeah, exactly. That whole philosophy of being able to train yourself to be in what I would label as just a Zen state, right. a Zen state within the exercise makes it so much more pleasurable mm -hmm. to be able to exercise. It makes you so more present and mindful about where you're at and, and who you are as you're doing that. Now, that's not including the other physical benefits. We've just been talking about just, just, just the spiritual right. right now. But the emotional benefits and the, the physical benefits with the idea that when people have emotional pain and emotional traumas and they're trying to deal with those, and then they start basically breathing into those past experiences that they've had and those traumas that they, they've had emotionally and then the present emotional states that they've got, they realize that they can apply it the same way. Mm -hmm. So now it begins to multiply all the philosophies that you trained with to do something just so physical within these movements. Well, you can apply that to other things. Right. You know, mentally, we talked about the idea of just, uh, you know, having a person that you have conflict with. And then now we were talking about just the, a little bit on the, the emotional portion of that one. So all these different philosophies that you can apply that to all from just coming in to practice some Tai Chi. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, I get kind of lost in, in some of the, the philosophy and the feeling because I'm just that's who I am. And because I'm not very rooted, I'm like, oh, let's just like avoid the physical aspect. But I had this experience last night. I went to the sound healing. OK, I'm laying there. I'm having this. <laughs> this experience and I, ha I kept getting this message that was saying like you are the earth right you have and so it was like when we nourish our body and when we care for our body and you know when we're taking care of ourselves that is how we take care of the earth so it's like I had this idea of like you know you want to save the rainforest we want to go out and we want to save the earth but the message that kept coming through was this is how you save the earth. Like this is how you take care of earth is by caring for the body. So when we do these physical things, it's not just because we want to look good. It's like being in shape, you know, and having this vital energy flowing through us. I mean, it's important for our longevity to make it for the long haul. It's not just about you know, being able to do it a certain way or whatever, but like we're nourishing ourselves in such a way when we do these physical exercises, that's like beyond. Well, I feel like with the physical exercise portion, you can look at this a few different ways. And one of those ways is that you can be selfish with it. And what I mean by that is that you can say like, well, I want to be able to have this perfect body and I want the tension from it. Just me, mm -hmm. me, me with it. At the same time, you can be completely unselfish with that same concept. I want to be healthy for my family, for my children, so that I don't become a burden to somebody else. I want to be healthy enough that I can help other people. And so you can achieve the same goal, but have two totally different right. motivations for it. And I think that when you begin to change yourself and you include others with that change, you'll have all these creative forces that are behind it to make it more successful. Mm -hmm. So when you have a person that comes in and they say, hey, I've, I've just had a heart attack. I want to start losing weight. And is chi Tai Chi something that can help me? I want to be healthy for my family. And I look at them and, and with all sincerity, I said, buddy, you've come to the right place <laughs> because we're not just going to help you. We're going to help your family. Right. We're going to make all of you healthy and well. Right. Because that person that came in that just had that heart attack and they're scared to death that they're not going to be healthy enough, we're going to change them and make them healthier so that they can be a better person, a better help meet to mm -hmm. all the other people that are around them too. Exactly. It extends beyond us. As we grow and we become stronger, you know, we can give more, you know, we can be better people for our communities, mm -hmm. you know, it's... It's important. And that, I think that was like the big message. So when it was saying like, don't you know, like you are the earth, like if I'm pulling the energy towards, you know, then I'm not able to give. And so that's, there's this energy exchange with earth. So it was like, it was good for me because I don't love the physical exercise, but it was like, if I could look at it as when I nourish myself, that I'm nourishing the mother, like the mother earth, right? Mm -hmm. That I'm doing my part by taking care of myself because then no one else is having to take care of me. Absolutely. So it's like I come into it with this neutral energy 
and then I can give from that versus Mm -hmm. just being bedridden at you know, 40 or, you know, already having back pain at 32, which I gotta do, but, you know, so it was just an interesting thing. Um, Let's see. Could you briefly share with us the essence behind some of the animal styles and symbols in Kung Fu? You mentioned something earlier about Kung Fu Panda. And I think (laughs) that Kung Fu Panda is a great movie that people can kind of latch onto with knowing something about Kung Fu. Right. Generally speaking, most people don't really know what Kung Fu is about. They know that it's a martial arts style, but they don't know much more than that. They know that it just punches and kicks, and that's pretty much the same thing as any other martial arts style. They all punch and kick. Mm-hmm. Well, the idea is that they say, is it anything like Kung Fu Panda? And I was like, absolutely, it actually is. Why is that? In, in the film... They had this panda, and he idolizes these five different types of fighting styles or these five different animals. And in the film, it kind of shows the idea of how they're almost like a comic book hero or superheroes that he has all this adoration for. Now, in the Chinese culture, it actually is that way with these old martial arts stories that people had. So, like, we grew up with, say, comic books or these superheroes of, you know, Batman and Superman, Spider-Man, etc., Well, they grew up with these martial arts heroes. And with these martial arts heroes, they have different attributes to them. And I think that these animal styles are so unique with each one, or in particular with the style of them, that you can't really compare them to each other to say, well, all of Kung Fu, they do it this particular way, which would be incorrect. So I'm going to just give you a couple of examples that are polar opposites of each other, what I'm talking about. So when you have the crane system, the crane is is very evasive. It's extremely patient when it fights. So an example of a crane fighter would be somebody who, as they're fighting somebody, maybe they let the opponent throw a couple punches or kicks first. They're kind of watching their timing. They're watching their footwork. They're watching the hand movements, how far they extend out with the hand and the feet, like understanding what that distance is. But then they're very precise. You can imagine like a crane beak being out to reach out and grab that fish so precisely out of the water. Well, with a crane fighter, they would do the same thing where their movement is extremely precise with where they want to be able to attack. Now, you can have a tiger fighter. They're going to be the polar opposite. They're going to be somebody who, just like a tiger in the wild, they're going to leap out at their prey. But when they do, they're unleashing everything that they've got. They're not holding back. They're not being patient with that. And what they're doing is they're forcing their opponent to submit to their will. And with that, a tiger can be very powerful, be very aggressive with the way that it fights. So with a tiger, it can also be very precise with its movements. But at the same time, though, it can be very generalistic with this movements. And you'll see this with uh, a tiger or any large cat, or any, actually even a house cat, with the way that they paw at or strike something, that they they do come out with the paw and then uh, extend the claws out and then claw at it and retract the claws back as they're doing the striking there. And you'll watch the movements like on, say, YouTube videos or uh, National Geographic, where they kind of are generalized with it. The, the idea is they're trying to strike the animal to be able to wound it somehow. And so a tiger fighter, they don't have to be real specific about where they're striking at. They're just looking for a generalized target for them to be able to wound with that one. Mm -hmm. So when you have two of these unique type of animals going into a fighting system, and then two people embody that fighting system, to where the moment that they start that fight, it's like, if I'm choosing the tiger, it's like, I I, I am the tiger Mm -hmm. for that moment. Or if I'm the crane, I am the crane for that moment. And they embody that for the the personality type and the movements that go along with it. You can see them have this interplay about how they're actually balancing each other out. Right. And so you'll see them go back and forth, and one's not necessarily greater than the other. Mm -hmm. And that's what confounds people. It's like, well, one's not necessarily greater than the other in its fighting ability. They're just simply different, which is actually why we, you know, teach so many different styles within Kung Fu. Right, because you might need to embody a different you know, form, you might need to, I was thinking about like the crane is like studying the tiger. It's learning. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is how it works. But if it spends too much time studying with the tiger going full force, it might 
make yourself susceptible, you know, so it's going to have well, to dodge. What but... would happen if you had two people and we'll just assume that their training is equal. We'll assume that one person studied both the crane and the tiger and another person just did tiger. So again, assuming that all things are equal, they've done the same amount of training, etc. And they come in to fight each other. Well, the person who has the crane and the tiger can counterattack a lot of the material mm -hmm. that the tiger person has because they've been waiting for a person to right. be able to be aggressive, maybe overextend themselves or something like that, or to reach out and do a movement when they weren't quite prepared for it. So they're sitting back there being patient and waiting for it. But because they've also studied the tiger, they know what's about to come because they've done some of the same movements or similar movements to that. So the person who's had two types of training or the two different styles would probably have an advantage over the person who has done the one style. Right. Do people tend to like choose one for the most part to focus on? Like do you, you know, maybe like certain body types would be more drawn to the tiger or. Well, in certain schools across the, well, across the globe now, like whether you're talking about China, the United States, Canada, Germany, all these places that have martial arts schools that are specifically Shaolin Kung Fu. Mm -hmm. You have some of those schools that are specific to one style. Like they may just do, just an example, just tiger, just praying mantis, ah. just white crane, etc. Okay. But then you have other schools that have a few of them also. So that's what we do at our schools. We have a, a few different styles that we teach out. And what we do in, in our particular curriculum, curriculum is that we give a variety of different types and styles. So by, by the time that they get to their black sash level, then the idea is that at that time, they can kind of pick and choose what their mastery system is. Now, what I mean by mastery system is the idea of a system that you studied the most. Right. And you want to understand the theory and the concepts that go behind it. So you kind of in, involve yourself in that particular system more so than other t styles and stuff at that time. So. That's interesting. Yeah, I've, I think I've talked to you about the show Marco Polo, but um, the the guy in that story is like obsessed with mantis. Like... I, he never talks about any of the other animals. He just spends his whole life just like watching them and mimicking them. And, and so I didn't think about it like that. Some people just embody one. They're not necessarily interested in all the other ones. But he was so he had perfected it so well that no one could even come up against him. So like someone might be Tiger, but he... I don't know. It's like he was fully embodied in the mantis energy somehow, which I never even imagined, you know, because it's it's a mantis, right? It's a bug <laughs> like it's but, you know, the more I thought about it, I was like, OK, it is a kind of an aggressive animal like it, the, it like bites its, you know, lover's head off or whatever after it, you know, mates. And so there is this fight in it. Right. Well, I think that. uh you were also asking about the different body types and personality types. So you, you would have somebody who, with specifically praying mantis, somebody who feels comfortable with fighting somebody up close. Mm. And this is somebody who will literally pull the person into them to be able to attack them. And specifically with praying mantis style, that personality type has to be somebody who's not afraid of getting some, getting, pulling somebody into their bu personal bubble or going into somebody else's. Right. They're not afraid to get that close to somebody. Mm. However, a crane personality type might be somebody who wants to keep people at bay, not have them come in really close to them. So when it comes into certain personality types, there are people who would tend to be one style of right. something over another. And then also when it gets into people's body sizes and shapes and their athletic ability, those definitely have a huge factor in what they might choose to be able to study, to master, to be able to go into. Right. Uh, I know that um, there's a lot of people who have an idea. They come into class and they just, they, you know, most people know about tiger systems and stuff like that when they think about Kung Fu. So they come in there and they're like, oh, I, you know, I'm going to love the tiger system. It's going to be my favorite. <laughs> they get in there. And they realize that there's a whole plethora of other styles that are in it. And they're like, oh, actually, I kind of like this better. Right. And it might be something that's like monkey, which is a very playful personality. This is somebody who might be confident or even overconfident in their martial arts to the point that they're actually toying with their opponent. Somebody who has such movements that baits the person to be able to do a movement so that they can counterattack that. And that would be a monkey personality. 
Uh, so there's just there's just so many to go into. So we're just picking just a handful to be able to discuss right now. But there is a style out there for pretty much any personality type. Right. And uh, with body sizes, there's something called long fist. And in long fist, uh, that particular style is usually for people who are taller, kind of mm-hmm. lankier people that have a large reach on them with their arms. And they typically enjoy that style a little more so than some of the others. So we can go into some of that at another time with just the idea of like people's body shapes with what they like. There are, um, there's even a system of the drunken style. And this literally was people who would become intoxicated and they were supposed to uh, be in the Chinese army and, you know, being on guard and, you know, defend anybody coming into that particular area that they were supposed to be defending. And if they were intoxicated, they couldn't do that. And so people would get, uh, you know, these generals would get very upset with their soldiers being intoxicated and, and not being able to fight. So they said, well, if we can't put a stop to this behavior and you're still going to continue drinking, then you have to learn how to fight while you're being drunk. Interesting. And so they, a whole style got created off the concept about people being lazy on the job and drinking. Wow. So when they created this style, it's, the, it's not about the idea of drinking while practicing Kung Fu. It's about the idea of keeping your body very loose and agile and being able to turn and twist your body and do a lot of different types of acrobatic movements to be able to evade and disguise your attack so that it may look like you're actually just stumbling and falling, but the reality is that you're wrapping your leg around theirs to be able to do a a grappling type of move to take somebody to the ground. And so there's all these other kind of styles that are out there that are not as well known. Wow, I definitely have never heard of that one. That is super <laughs> interesting. I love it. So um, have you ever had to use Kung Fu on anyone? Uh, I have a, a, just, just a few times. Uh, there was one time when I was in middle school. And as I was in middle school, there was uh, a bully that was there. And he was trying to punch at me and pull me down some stairs. And I... All, all I did was just throw one side kick and kicked him down the stairs. And fortunately, I had a teacher that was there. She saw the whole thing, and I did not get into any trouble. It was a different time period. Because I think now every kid that's involved is suspended. Right. didn't happen that time period. They just said Daniel didn't do anything. He was just simply defending himself. And when he kicked the kid down the stairs, it was, it was just simply, you know, trying to get him off of him. Right. So that was just a real, you know, just something simple. The kid was fine and everything like that. Just had a couple of bumps and bruises and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, another time is that I was working at a clothing department store here in Knoxville. And uh, I was asked by security if I would help them to be able to apprehend somebody because they were uh, short on people for the day. So it was just one security person and then myself. And uh, I stood in front of the store. I stopped the guy. And he threw down the stuff that he had stolen. And uh, when he did, he took a swing at me. He was pretending that he was, you know, I'm I'm cool. I'm going to throw the stuff down. No big deal. You know, I'll cooperate with you. And when he did, I just did something that I was just practicing literally at that time period that just happened to fit what he was doing for the movement. And then I put him on the ground. And uh, when I put him on the ground, I put his arm behind his back and he started yelping. <laughs> and I got kind of concerned because I thought, well, I'm, I'm not trying to injure this person. I just right. want to apprehend him. And he was being overly dramatic. And all of these people started like watching and looking. And so I, I helped him back up on his feet. And he kept telling us that everything was cool. And then he did the exact same thing again. He took another swing at me. And this time I did hold his arm behind his back. And then the police came there and then apprehended him and stuff. And then uh, later on, I joined the sheriff's department. Uh, this was just for a couple of years in 2005 and six. And then there was just a, just a handful of times that I had to use it for simple things. Mm-hmm. But the only way I could describe it being different is it's much different when fighting somebody who's trying to get away from you compared to somebody who's out to get you. Right. <laughs> so it's a little bit different with that kind of situation. So just, just little things within martial arts that I've had to use in, in real life but nothing too substantial. Right. But you probably appreciated the, the preparation that was there. Cause it was it, a lot of times when those situations come up, it's like, bam, right. You have to, if you're not kind of a master of it, you're, you're not going to think quick enough, right. You're not going to just 
deflect it or, mm-hmm. or whatever. It's something that does come with practice. So well, I would like to throw out there all the times that martial arts prevented something happening. Oh, okay. And I think this is an interesting concept for people. Well, sometimes energetically, we carry a kick me sign on our back. Now, there's a statement by Buddha, and it's confusing to a lot of people. And he said, there's a certain form of enlightenment that you haven't reached it until you realize that you are the murderer and the one being murdered. And people are like, wait a second, that doesn't make much sense. You know, like, how could you be the murderer and also the one being murdered? And part of the philosophy that he was talking about, this concept that he was talking about, is the idea that people can be like a coin where it has two sides. So they can be opposite sides of the same coin, but the coin is still one and the same. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at is that some people can be a perpetrator. And when they become a perpetrator and they hurt somebody, that victim that they created with that, they can perpetuate that. They can become the perpetrator again, and they can hurt other people because they're hurt. Mm. Or... They can be the victim. They were the victim that one time, and they can sustain that, and they're constantly a victim. And you'll notice this being a pattern in a lot of people's life where they were abused as a child, and they also become the abuser. Right. Or sometimes they're abused, and through because of this abuse, then they embody being a victim. Yes. Not just in that, but it could be in anything in life. Mm-hmm. Like whether it's just did they go to the store and they get ripped off by being overcharged something. It's the idea that they're just constantly being a victim with something. Mm-hmm. So what I mean by what I prevented through martial arts is the idea is because I embody this empowerment that I had through martial arts, I also put out that that energy that I'm not a victim with mm-hmm. someone. And I feel like that has prevented a whole bunch of things that I'll never even know existed because I was not put into those situations because I wasn't a victim and I wasn't attracting the opposite side of that coin was the perpetrator. So I'm not attracting it. Right. That totally makes sense. Now, I've had a lot of a lot of people come into self-defense classes and they'll tell me I had something happen to me. I want to make sure this never happens again. Mm-hmm. And I tell them, I said, if you stick with this and you embody the energy that you're no longer afraid and you're no longer a victim, you don't have to worry about it. It won't come in your life again because you're not attracting that. I, I totally relate to that. I had a different experience with coming to terms with the victim archetype of, you know, I felt victimized by my childhood, my upbringing, you know, and really embodied like, oh, I'm just, I'm just, I I was set up for this, like, and, and then I would put myself in these relationships where I was, you know, being this victim, and and there was this bad guy, right, and there was a point when I started doing, like, kundalini yoga, and I really started feeling this inner power where I had to accept that I had allowed that archetype to manifest negatively in my life that yes I mean when you're a child you don't have full control but as I you know became an adult I did I was consciously choosing these people or putting myself in these situations where I would be you know like abused or whatever but there was a a very distinct point when I started practicing yoga you know and and studying these philosophies where I actually did I detached from that victim mentality and so i'm not saying i might i'll never experience it again but since like looking at it that way i haven't really resonated with the victim archetype in quite a while and and it's been really empowering honestly to come out on the other end of that you know and say okay what am i actually doing here that's creating that experience and what can i do to avoid those experiences Mm -hmm. right so what you said it's so cool like how, you know, you can come to these realizations in different ways, you know, but they're kind of important at some point to to face or to think about, you know, maybe that's all you do. Maybe all you do is think about it, but I don't know. I feel like that's how we grow, right? It's to, to think in those ways. So, all right. So we're kind of wrapping up the show. Um, what's the best way for our listeners to contact you and learn more? Um, Also, how do they sign up for a class? Well, the best way to be able to check out what we have to offer to see the class schedule, the times, the pricing, all of that, etc., will all be on our website. And you can find us at traditionalshaolin.com. 
And Shaolin is spelled S-H-A as in Apple. It was in October. L-I-N. TraditionalShaolin.com. We keep everything up front for all the pricing, the schedule, everything you can find on there. You actually don't have to contact us or call us about uh, any kind of the things on the on the website for questions. I've got everything listed out there. However, if you would like to sign up for a class, all you have to do is just send me an email. And again, you can find that on the website there. All right. That sounds great. Well, thank you so much for coming out. I have immensely enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yes, anytime. And thank you all for tuning in. Check us out next time on the Astral Hour. Bye.